variants that the uh, internet was was built on we've got quite a number of papers published on this but these uh, include uh, things like the internet being uh, decentralized of any uh, or, or free of any centralized control um, apart from the coordination of the domain name system of course but also uh, the internet being end-to-end -end, uh, traffic uh, being able to to travel from network to network um, and uh, the internet of course being uh, uh, being uh, uh, open uh, for for everyone to connect to uh, to connect to and I guess um, some of these values really have been eroded a little bit over time uh, we can see that with uh, the change in network neutrality and filtering and so on some of those values have been uh, somehow eroded but more recently there has been a uh, a bit more emphasis uh, due to several conflicts around the world on the network being accessible by everyone and uh, and actually some calls by uh, uh, some countries to actually disconnect some parts of the network now <laughs> technically speaking it's already a, a challenging thing because as we know the, it's, a, it's a network of networks and with this being uh, architectured the way it is it's pretty hard to disconnect specific parts of, of a network that is completely interconnected by several links to the other uh, to other parts of the world and especially when one looks at the geography of it because as we know the internet is not delimited by countries but actually by networks which sometimes span several countries so the uh, the real world limitations of uh, nation states uh, often doesn't apply except in those places where nation states have actually established some very strict controls over the traffic that comes in and out of the country we'll be touching on many of these issues uh, i guess uh, in, in today's call but this uh, session itself was triggered um, among the, the organizers by the uh, uh, request of uh, ukraine uh, a certain while ago at the beginning of the the war uh, where uh, russia invaded uh, ukraine of uh, this, this uh, beginning of this conflict where um, the uh, Ukrainian GAC representative and the Ukrainian government asked for uh, first ICANN to uh, somehow put a block on uh, top level domains .ru and .su, the Russian, the two Russian top level domains, country code top level domains. So it asked for ICANN to, to do something about that and block it and also asked other uh, network providers to effectively block the Russian internet and, and cut Russia off from the internet. The uh, story goes that uh, the request was received and the request was kindly declined because these organizations uh, that today run the technical identifiers like, uh, uh, the, well, I, IP address distribution like RIPE NCC and ICANN that coordinates the global uh, system identifiers of uh, d domain names are not political organizations. They're not the United Nations with uh, 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 resolutions that get voted at the General Assembly, etc. These are technical organizations that are there to make sure the internet works. And therefore, disconnecting the internet uh, is not something that is in their mandate as such. And especially when it comes down to anything that is politi uh, uh, political, um, politically uh, inclined or uh, triggered by uh, by real world uh, items, so we have some kind of a of a, a, a an empty space, if you want, in that. Now, aside from that, of course, the, the question is who who would, if there was such a possibility to turn some parts of the uh, internet off, who would have the the uh, famous kill switch? Who would have the uh, possibility to turn things on and off? It's not unknown that some parts of the world have some countries have turned off the internet in their part of the world but usually they have done it um, as turning it off in their own territory uh, from whom they, they have jurisdiction but for an international organization to do that it's completely uncharted uh, territory yet some leading members of the internet community signed a common statement um, uh, also back uh, a few months ago toward the multi-stakeholder imposition of internet sanctions um, and that opens the door to the internet community having some kind of means to decide on whether sanctions such as disconnection or other kind of traffic throttling um, uh, would be appropriate or not. There's a statement that is actually um, published and linked to our agenda. If you haven't read it, I would um, strongly advise that you have a, have a look at it. Um, and in fact, we, we have uh, several panelists that will be able to, to speak about this too. Now, um, I don't have a full view of who is in 
um, in uh, Ethiopia, in Addis Ababa. Um, I welcome you in, in the room. I welcome those uh, participants online. And so today our speakers include Bastian Goslings, um, who is the Senior Policy and Government Advisor for RIPE NCC. Um, RIPE NCC being the organization that uh, distributes um, the uh, IP addresses, internet protocol addresses throughout the European and Middle Eastern uh, uh, region. They cover a pretty wide region, one of the regional internet registries. We have Bill Woodcock, who's joining us online, uh, who's the executive director of Packet Clearinghouse. Um, and uh, Bill has been uh, one of the signatories of uh, this, uh, um, this uh, statement regarding uh, a multi-stakeholder imposition of internet sanctions. So hopefully he'll be able to, to uh, shed some light over this and, and um, take it from there. We have Iria Puyosa, um, who's an International Research Advisory Council member uh, an advisory uh, advisor on social media and peace building at the Toda Institute in Washington, D.C. Um, and then Veronika Datzer is also joining us. She's a policy advisor in the German parliament, uh, but she was previously uh, a researcher uh, for uh, NATO. So uh, with the uh, current conflict in Ukraine, um, NATO being one of the uh, one of the uh, the incumbents, I guess, somehow um, not being directly related to the conflict, but uh, with all the countries around it. Um, she'll probably be able to, to shed some light on um, the network uh, side of things and, and network situation. And then, of course, we have Vinton Cerf, um, who is uh, joining us, the internet evangelist from Google. Um, Vint, unfortunately, has to leave in about an hour's time, so I'm probably speaking a bit too much and, and impeding on his time, which is often what I do at the beginning of these calls. I'm Olivier crepin um Joining us online also, is uh, Alejandro Pizanti and uh, Shiva Subramanian Mutusami and Jolie McPhee also the uh, with the four co-organizers of this uh, of this session. Um, now let's uh, move on forward, and I think that the first thing that maybe would be helpful is if, if uh, Bill Woodcock um, could take us through this um, this background, or if you want, on on how did this uh, statement towards the multi-stakeholder imposition of internet sanctions came up, and uh, I guess what what it actually proposes, and then we can take it from there and and look at uh, whether it's appropriate for um, the the internet to be turned on or off uh, with with those uh, kinds of uh, situations. If the internet technical infrastructure uh, is currently uh, as it currently is defined. Uh, able to impose sanctions as such? Um, is the internet management and administration as currently defined willing to impose sanctions? Or, and in fact, if it does, uh, isn't it breaking core internet values? So quite a number of things to, to discuss here. Uh, but let me uh, uh, stop right now and uh, turn it over to Bill Woodcock. And I, I think Bill, Bill is joining us online, I think, as well. So, um, well, I know he is. So welcome to you. And I see Alejandro has made it. Excellent. Welcome. And the question is, has Bill joined us actually online? Uh, thank you, Olivier. Welcome, everybody. I don't see Bill on the <laughs> roster here. Problem. Okay, that's a uh, bit so of a I could, great I could sign. Take this over to you, Alejandro. Quickly. Yeah, go ahead, because Alejandro, you've been following this quite closely. So please. Well, I was one of the signatories of the of the statement and uh, I was invited by Bill and, 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 and others and consultants before it was actually finalized uh, and drafted. So very briefly, the question is there may be part, there are parties on, on the internet, in the internet management, uh, who uh, believe that there should be a response to the, to the, the, the request but, uh, made by the, uh, by the Ukrainian authorities. So let's go one step back. There was a request from the UK, uh, Ukrainian authorities to ICANN, uh, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, uh, to shut down uh, a number of functions um, for uh, Russia on the internet, such as blocking the CCTLD, uh, blocking some sets of IP addresses, and so forth. Uh, these are some of these uh, requests are not within ICANN's authority at all, such as uh, dealing with certificates and others uh, would require a process that has to be equitable and has to be bottom up and has to be rigorous in order not to be arbitrary. 
So I can decline their request. It did uh, do something which is provide some funds for uh, for keeping the infrastructure uh, functioning in the Ukraine while it was being damaged by the war. And on the other hand, a number of parties, which are uh, ISPs and others, uh, others who run the uh, certain of the key operations of the internet, uh, decided to work on whether there's a scheme for imposing the equivalent of sanctions on the internet. It has to be a multi-stakeholder process. It has to be bottom up. It has to be some policy development for these decisions. It has to be equitable and fair, uh, and it also has to be protective of the uh, functioning of, of the internet as a whole, as a global interoperable end-to-end -end network. So there's a number of criteria for the equivalent of sanctions. Which the equivalent of sanctions would be, for example, to blocking certain traffic from certain origins or towards certain destinations, which is considered harm, harmful. And uh, for deciding what is uh, is uh, how how to choose what traffic or how to designate what traffic you would block. This is a voluntary process. It's not imposed by by any law, and uh, the the criteria are very similar. They have a precedent for traffic management on the internet against spam, phishing, and other malicious activity. So that's basically what you get. You have to have a a criteria that's very similar to that. Uh, that is based on real risks. And that's uh, uh, also reversible and minimally uh, damaging, or at least potentially minimally damaging for other operations. One of the things that are opposed, for example, when you try to block dot, uh, dot RU, uh, the domain name for the CCTLD domain name for Russia, is that you would be precluding r Russian citizens from getting information from outside. You have a country at war, you have a control. Uh, internal governmental control over the communications, and you would actually be reinforcing that by isolating the country's population. So that's the kind of considerations that went into this statement. And uh, it has now been a few months around, we have to see who has enacted it and what the consequences and the assessment uh, of the consequences are. Thanks. I, I hope, Olivia, that uh, serves as an introduction. Certainly, if Bill joins, he will, he'll be able to provide some more up to date uh, information about this. Thank you very much, Alejandro. Uh, it is uh, very good to have you being able to stand in. I just got a note from Bill that he is stuck um, at the moment and he has a problem joining, but he will be hopefully joining us in a short uh, moment. Um, the next speaker I would suggest perhaps would be to start with Vint Cerf because I know that Vint has to leave at the top of the hour and then we'll go through each one of our panelists and have their opening uh, uh, statement and, and uh, an angle on uh, on the topic. So let's have Vint Cerf, please. Uh, that's very kind of you, Olivier. I actually don't have to leave until 10.30, our time local, but uh, I'll take advantage of an open microphone anyway, as you all know. Uh, first of all, I think it's vital to uh, appreciate that the internet is nothing if it isn't connected. And so its connectivity is vital to maintain to the extent that we can at all times. The notion of uh, some of, uh, of uh, sanctions and things of that kind uh, is, are not unreasonable, especially for bad behavior uh, in the online world. And this is a topic of continuous discussion, uh, certainly within the leadership panel uh, and other parts of the IGF. Uh, and we do need to take into account doing something about bad behavior. But my strong view is that the something that we should do should not be to shut down the internet. Now, you all already know that some parts of the world are capable of shutting down their pieces of the internet. And this is perfectly okay from the engineering point of view. We, not, we may not like it from the policy point of view, but it is technically possible to shut down pieces of internet. There are several ways to do it. The first one is to turn off all the electricity and let the batteries run out. Uh, the second thing is to shut down the underlying communication system that carries the packets, which is a typical way in which some countries turn off uh, access to the internet. Um, we can't do anything about that, but as long as that behavior doesn't leak out of the borders of the, uh, of the uh, country that chooses 
uh, to do that, uh, to shut uh, the Internet down domestically. Uh, I think it's well within their um, territorial rights to, to exercise that prerogative. Uh, we can all object to it. Uh, we can look for ways of helping citizens get back uh, into access on the net. But I don't think that we should take a position that uh, countries aren't allowed to turn off the Internet. We, do, we don't like it, but I don't think that we can stop it. On the other hand, we don't want the entire Internet to be shut, uh, shut off. What we want to do is to make sure that under all circumstances uh, our notion of universal connectivity is maintained, that the basic Internet infrastructure is apolitical, that it is insensitive to the kinds of traffic that flow. That's both a benefit and a hazard. It's a benefit because we don't care what applications flow in the packets. That makes the Internet an extremely flexible system. When new applications come along, as you know, uh, you get to reinterpret the bits in the packet, and that allows you to implement a new application without changing the network, and that has been a very important property of the Internet design. Uh, at the same time, because it's so neutral, uh, it will also transport really bad stuff. And we all recognize that we have to do something about it, but we need to do it, uh, something about it at the right layer in its architecture. And it's not the right place to do it is not to shut off the routing system. Now, there are certain situations where actions are taken for bad behavior that are down in the uh, closer to the core of the Internet. Some of you uh, will remember that there was a uh, global council on the uh, stability of cyberspace. And they put together about, I don't know, a dozen suggested norms for behavior in the online environment. And one of their first norms was to say that we should have an agreement, a norm, not necessarily a treaty, that said we would not attack and undermine the basic core of the Internet. That means you don't attack the routers, you don't attack the domain name servers, you don't attack the underlying uh, communication systems that link the routers to each other. That is was a norm that they recommended, thinking that if we adopted a norm, that it might later even become something that could be treaty material. And I agree with that basic idea, but now let me remind you of things that take place which I think are legitimate. In the domain name system, well, in the, in the browser system, let me get this right, in the browser system, which is up in the application space, it's possible that you will detect a badly behaved certificate authority. And we're, re we're relying on the certificate authorities for uh, DNSSEC, for example. And if a certificate authority has issued a false certificate that would cause us to believe that a particular domain name goes to an, ad, an IP address where it really doesn't belong, the browser people, including ours at Google, have taken it on themselves to shut down their belief in that particular certificate authority. They will not give credit to uh, a certificate coming from a sanctioned certificate authority. And that sanctioning takes place at uh, the level of the browser operation. So. I consider that to be a very reasonable response for protecting users from harm. So that's an example of, of that. Now, what about a denial of service attack? Suppose you're an internet service provider, you're operating a piece of the internet, and someone launches a denial of service attack against a target. We should not close our eyes to that. We should not take the view that it's okay if that denial of service attack continues uh, because we don't want to touch the operation of the Internet. In fact, a responsible ISP will try to divert that uh, denial of service attack. One way to do that is to black hole the traffic coming from a particular source. Another possibility is to divert the traffic so that it doesn't hit the uh, actual target. So there are going to be situations in which uh, a kind of sanctioning takes place in the operational Internet or in the application space. I don't think that violates our basic notion that the Internet should continue to operate as much as possible at all times. But we do have to accept that bad behavior has to be dealt with. 
I would draw your attention to the various ways in which bad behavior is dealt with in other contexts. One of them is to impose sanctions in a different domain, for example, financial sanctions. You'll see companies being fined for bad behavior. Uh, you'll see uh, in the case of, of Russia today and in, in the course of the Ukraine war that a number of financial sanctions have been taken against Russia. And those are examples of ways in which you can introduce sanctions that don't necessarily undermine the basic operation of the Internet. So you can imagine considering sanctions, but I don't think that they should t cause the Internet to malfunction. So, uh, Olivier, I'll stop there. I, I want to uh, say just one other thing, that whatever you have to say on this subject is important to me because I want to be able to convey your views back to the leadership panel, which I will be meeting with at 10.45 today. And so this is just an example of, of the important opportunity for you to deliver information to me and other members of the leadership panel so we can uh, assimilate that uh, into our thinking. So I'm eager to hear your view of how we should deal with bad behavior. Thank you very much for your views, uh, Vint, and uh, uh, thanks for relaying this over to the leadership panel. I know there, there have been a, a number of questions as to how the leadership panel would be fed but with the bottom-up process of the IGF, and it's great to see that one of its active participants is actually uh, completely practicing the, uh, the bottom-up model. Now, Bill has made it, Bill Woodcock, and so I'd like to turn over to him uh and um to uh, to to expand on on both what what Vinter said of course and uh, also on that letter that uh, he co-signed hey uh my apologies again for being late uh, i <clears throat> walked over to my office to join from my office and found that the building management had changed the door <clears throat> door code overnight without um, warning anybody because this is you know crazy early for anybody to be um at work at Paris. So um, I was one of the GCSC commissioners, one of the authors of the um, uh, norms that Vint just mentioned. And so I, of course, agree with those and agree with uh, Vint's agreement with them. Um, the problems with uh, sanctions are in two areas. Hang on just a moment. Sorry, it's also time for kids to be off to school here. Um, so there, there are basically two problems. One is on the side of the internet service providers who have to do the blocking. The other is on the side of the government. The problem on the side of internet service providers is typically overcompliance. Um, there's also undercompliance, but undercompliance is kind of the default state, right? If people don't uh, do anything to comply with sanctions, then the sanctioned entity gets away with whatever it is that they were doing that was bad. Uh, but, you know, they're probably going to get away with it. Also, the point of the sanction is just to add friction for them, right? To increase their costs, um, decrease society's costs in subsidy of them. Um, on the side of government, the problem is harmonization. Um, what we found in implementing all this is that there are many governments and intergovernmental organizations which define sanctions like the united nations and the european union and the united states and the uk and japan uh, each have their own sanctions regime um, of all of the sanctions regimes in the world the only one that is machine readable and published in a single uh, predictable location is that of the United Kingdom. And their system for doing so was broken last time I checked. So it's, it's, they're doing the right thing, but it's not always available and it's not harmonized with any other governments. So they're doing the right thing from a unilateral perspective. But what's really needed here is harmonization between governments and sanctions regimes. That doesn't mean that every sanctions regime has to cover exactly the same sanctioned entities. What it does mean is that when two of them are covering the same sanctioned entity, that it be identifiable that that is the same one. Uh, and right now that's not possible because most sanctioned regimes are published in the form of somebody saying, 
hey, you, intern, type up a memo, throw it on the top of the stack of the other memos. Last time we did that. And then hopefully it gets disseminated somehow. Um, so they're all like published in different formats, you know, on paper that has been mimeographed and then scanned and facts somewhere. And uh, they all transliterate the names of the sanctioned entities into the local governance language without leaving the original for comparison. And each of these transliterations winds up being completely different. Um, you get things like, uh, I think we found 23 different renderings of the Russian phrase joint stock corporation, right? So if there were 23 different sanctions regimes, you would find, you know, as many as 23 different renderings of the name of the same organization. Um, and so as a network operator, that input is garbage, right? It's almost impossible to work from that input. So the, the amount of harm to the internet of someone blocking a sanctioned entity is very close to zero, right? Um, you know, or, or it's a, a, a large net positive in many cases, right? The, the troll farm is sanctioned. If the troll farm were actually blocked from the internet, we would have far less disinformation and, uh, you know, things would be better. There's a lot of online crime that would go away if sanctioned entities were blocked from the internet. If North Korean military units were blocked from the internet, there would be a lot less um, cyber crime around cryptocurrency theft, for instance. Um, so there are a lot of net positives from actually implementing sanctions, uh, but when network operators are faced between a choice of trying to figure out the garbage input and doing, you know, and failing and either doing nothing with it or over complying, that's what they do. Either they do nothing or they over comply. Both are bad outcomes, right? Because neither, uh, neither helps the internet, neither embodies the spirit of the law that applies to the internet service provider. Uh, but fundamentally, uh, if the input is not garbage, if governments are able to harmonize and to render uh, sanctions in the native script and canonical form <laughs> of the name of the sanctioned entity, then the detective work to figure out what internet resources are associated with the sanctioned entity is actually surprisingly well in hand. Um, there are people who like doing internet detective work and much of it is subject to automation anyway. It's really not that big a deal. Um, and, you know, we're already very good at doing this because we already block lots and lots and lots of internet resources uh, for anti-malware, anti-phishing, anti child pornography, anti-terrorism reasons, right? There are many, many reasons the internet is already blocking uh, resources. Looking just at Quad9 that I'm on the board of, we're blocking about 4 million uh, resources in any given time with a daily turnover of, of about 400,000, right? So, and a, a false positive rate of, I think, 0.06%. Um, so, and a, 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 a removal time, I can't remember the removal time is just, it's like in the minutes, right? So in the, the very, very infrequent instances in which something gets blocked by accident, the internet is really good at fixing that problem also. So there isn't a technical problem with implementing sanctions once the sanctioned entities and their resources are identified. Um, and you know we have sort of the the implementation project that is you know largely done so the work at this point is really all about government harmonization and uh there is a fairly substantial effort underway there but harmonizing anything between many governments is a inherently slow project so um that's where things are right now uh to the best of my knowledge and understanding. 
and I'm sure there will be lots of discussion, time for questions later. So I'll stop here. Thanks very much for this, Bill. Uh, very interesting uh, angle uh, on, the, on the topic. I'm going to rearrange things a, a little bit because the, the speakers as listed in our uh, agenda were listed in first name alphabetic order. Um, you mentioned sanctions and sanctions obviously uh, in, in many cases are, are things that happen at the United Nations with, uh, with uh, uh, member states. Uh, and um, Verena Gedatz, uh, uh, who is with us as a policy advisor for the in the German Parliament, um, and uh, so they, they Germany is is of course one of those countries that that could impose sanctions, and uh, so I wanted to turn over to her and uh, get her angle on the uh, topic. Veronica, please, you have the floor. Wonderful. Does it work now? Yes. Okay. Sorry, it does. We can I, hear you. Thank you. Okay. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, as already mentioned, I'm a policy advisor, so my views are, of course, very political. Um, before I go into the German or maybe European perspective, uh, maybe just two quick words on NATO. Um, NATO itself doesn't sanction, um, and this was actually never really discussed. Um, the focus was more on how can we become more resilient with regards to A, supporting Ukraine and B, supporting all NATO allies in uh, in case of, of, of cyber attacks. But but sanctioning by NATO as, as an actor, so to say, wasn't really in the room. Um, I would like to start with sanctions generally. Um, Sanctions have been found to not necessarily work uh, if they are very general. This is when it comes to financial sanctions, this is when it comes um, in, in regimes um, that we've seen in, throughout the 1950s to 2000s, I would say. Sanctions only work when they are targeted or they have the possibility to work when they're targeted. Um, and Sanctioning the internet in an entire country is the very opposite to a targeted sanction. Um, so whilst, of course, in, in Germany and in Europe, everyone was very much shocked by the events and is still horrified by it, sanctioning or, or cutting Russia off the internet as, as such wasn't really up on the tables because it would predominantly harm not only the regime, but the people living there. Um, and that also includes people that might actually want to uh, protest against what's going on in terms of the injustices. But also, as we see with cyber attacks worldwide, we never quite understand how wide the consequences can be because often actors are impacted by internet shutdowns or cyber attacks um, that we don't see as the primary or the central actors that should be sanctioned, targeted, etc. Um, so whilst I understand the, the call for it, um, I do believe also from a political point of view that um, the effects would have been dramatic and very much averse um, across the entire world. Um, nevertheless, I think we need to look at the internet as a from a political perspective, and I think that's why I'm here. Um, it is no longer a neutral place in the world. Um, and as just mentioned, we need to find ways to tackle the harm that is going on there. Um, the internet is so much part of international relations as well as domestic politics because it simply defines every part of our lives at the moment. It's not just the economy, but society security, military security. So we need to find solutions. And I do think we cannot no longer see the internet as simply a neutral place because it is very geopolitical and it has an impact on every part of our life. Um, I would like to go more from sanctioning the internet towards because I don't think that's that's a solution that we can do, uh, that we can, can work on. But I would like to make two points um, on um, the other side of it. I think we do need to 
make uh, big tech companies more responsible and for them to take up more responsibility in uh, keeping the internet open um, and free and in my point of view also democratic um, that's a political view but bear in mind that is why I came here I guess um, and I think the other thing apart from a more political view that we expect from um, the I guess infrastructure of the internet as well as the companies um, connected to that is a an approach that helps to prevent nationalization of or fragmentation of, uh, from the internet we see not necessarily internet sanctions as the challenge or a driver of internet fragmentation but more nationalization because when the debate on internet sanctions came up also came up the debate that Russia wanted to shut off its entire internet from the rest of the world. Um, and we see that in, in countries that it, internet infrastructure can become more nationalized, um, for example, in China. And I think this is something um, we need diplomacy, we need big tech, um, but we need um, all of us to kind of work against because that is also a, a challenge that we need, we need to look at and that we need to um, fight against. Um, for in terms of internet fragmentation um for me um iran is another example i would like to add here um we see that the internet is shut down there uh, and demonstrations are made increasingly challenging by that um and i think it is our duty to react as a from a democratic pr um, perspective and i think not only Iran, but also what is going on with regards to Twitter, um, for example. Um, Elon Musk, for me, is a political issue. Um, Starlink deactivating or activating is a political issue. We can no longer think the internet is neutral. And so this is my call to think of it as a political space. Um, think of it as a space that can be democratic, open and free. Um, if we work together and we, if we keep it open. And of course, in terms of the infrastructure, neutral, but to find political solutions to the harm that is done. Thank you very much for this, uh, Veronica. And I see a couple of hands up. What I'd like to do is to first give the floor to all of the panelists. And then indeed, uh, when you put your hand up, we'll be able to go through questions and comments on the different interventions that we've had. We've spoken of sanctions and um, we do have a participant from a, a country that has been uh, subjected to sanctions, and um, that's uh, Area Piosa uh, from uh, uh, Venezuela. Interestingly, um, sanctions on Venezuela have not targeted internet, but uh, the, the, there's been some other type of, uh, uh, I guess, uh, interventions on, on the internet itself. Let's, uh, let's hear from Area Piosa. Welcome. Thank you for inviting me to be part of the panel. Yes, uh, Venezuela have been on their on their uh, uh, series of uh, fierce uh, personal uh, individual sanctions uh, uh, for uh, government officers that have been going on for uh, since 2014, as I remember, and um, more recently, since 2018-19, it started to get some economic and financial uh, financial sanctions going into the uh, oil industry mostly uh, um, the country have been being sanctioned on the use of uh, internet resources and actually been some some issues about uh, uh, people asking about uh, in internet uh, uh, internet uh, entities uh, i can uh, internet governance forums to had uh, any some pronunciation about issues of uh, uh, censorship and um, blocking of the content on the internet in Venezuela, and it, it never, it never uh, moved on. So the the answer on in this in these uh, bodies in general was, was was we are no political bodies. We are not going to discuss the political situations of any specific countries, and we can add on that. That that was that was always the answer every time that 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 issue came out. As and I think it was similar to it wasn't specific to Venezuela. I think it was similar to other countries with autocratic regimes had. Uh, 
uh, issues of human rights violations, including issues uh, directly affecting freedom online. Um, and even though as a person working on issues of uh, policies uh, uh, related with human rights and freedom of expression online, I will be advocating for more attention to these issues in Latin America, particularly the area I, I will work, but actually globally, uh, I really understand that princip principle of uh, the, the technical um, infrastructure in the internet and the technical bodies uh, uh, warding those in that infrastructure, infrastructure being neutral. And it had been a long way on that process. We have uh, we have, we have that process until we are now. Now I started to see in when forums like this in the internet governance forums and other discussions people are uh, are starting to move to uh, where we should not be that neutral we should tackle some uh, harms and i cannot see that with uh, concern i'm concerned about where is going to stop that uh, that involvement in political issues where, where we are going to draw the line on what is something and body like I can or the Internet Governance Forum as a kind of advisory space, a space of dialogue or deliberation can intervene in political issues. Um, we are we talking about here like imposing sanctions to bad actors, but who is going to define who is a bad actor? What are the criteria for that? What is the rule, the process, the rule of law to apply that? What is the, what is the, what is, first, what is the law? What is the process? Who are the actors? What are the criteria? So, so all of that is, seems to be very confused. And I feel like it's a lot of pressure for, from both authoritarian uh, governments trying to, to impose their view about sovereign internet and democratic countries trying to establish uh, some restraints for those authoritarian countries. And uh, is, I, I had my own political views, but I don't see uh, how a, a body like I can, can make a decision about what is the right political stance. So we are entering a very dangerous situation in a very co complex uh, space and um, talking of, from the point of view of kind of civil society i think the only way to get out of that that conflict is to take a very political stance but centering human rights so instead of deciding uh, uh well, this is the majority of the countries in this particular political forum decided they want to sanction the other country and the internet uh, technical bodies execute that sanction. They do the technical work to, to make happen what these political uh, actors have decided. Uh, I don't see that happen. I see the, the, so, uh, the creation of some uh, policy advisory body who uh, can uh, oversee with all the political actors are respecting human rights online, are protecting uh, uh, data, protecting freedom of expression, protecting access. So that that should be the role of, of this, of, of, of the kind of organization, the multi-stakeholder system of internet governance should be taking that role. So, so centering human rights instead of being the executors of political decisions taken from any sort of coalitions who happen to be the, the majority in the in, in a specific conflict otherwise it's going to be the, a, a very con con controversial space and a space for growing conflicts and i don't believe where we are we want to go there Thank you very much for this area. We, we therefore have a proposal on the table for um, how, how to judge uh, on those uh, 
on those uh, uh, decisions uh, using a, a human rights framework uh, approach. How do we implement something like this? Uh, let me turn to Bastian Goslings from RIPE NCC. Is, is RIPE uh, geared for this sort of thing, imposing sanctions, uh, actually uh, turning uh, policy into um, actions on the internet? Uh, thank you very much, Olivier. Uh, nice to see you all. Uh, my name is Sebastian Goslings, indeed representing the RIPE NCC. Um, you briefly referred to it, Olivier, in your introduction, but uh, for those who are not aware, the RIPE NCC, ESO IP European Network Coordination Center, is the regional internet registry for the region Europe, Central Asia, Middle East, including uh, the former Soviet uh, republics. And the core service that we provide, so we do many uh, things, but the core service we provide is the allocation of IP address space previously IPv4, but that's run out uh, for us now, uh, and IPv6 address space to our members, which currently are more than 20,000 uh, entities that run their own networks and require these resources uh, across that entire uh, service region. Um, the RIPE NCC itself, uh, the organization, is based in the Amsterdam uh, in the Netherlands. It's an association, a non-profit organization, and needs to abide by Dutch law more and more uh, uh, law is not necessarily initiated within the Netherlands, but coming from uh, Brussels, the European Union. And um, from that perspective, I, I think it's, it's, it's important, like we, we talked about um, the request we, we, we got from the, from the Ukraine in, in, in March, and um, I cannot, I think my, my neighbor, Vince Cerf, you know, he put it very, very eloquently, you know, what um, the risk is, you know, if we really get uh, the, the underlying infrastructure, the core of the internet involved in these type of uh, uh, matters. And our, our response was also to, uh, towards the Ukrainian government that uh, as unfortunate and as tragic as the situation is in the, in, in the Ukraine, I mean, we re really sympathize with, uh, with, with the need, you know, uh, uh, to, 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 to act, you know, upon the aggression that is inflicted on them. Uh, we could not uh, follow up on the request, and the basic one that af affected us was uh, actually a request to withdraw all uh, IP address space from our, our Russian uh, members. Um, it's not in our mandate. Um, it's not within the policies, you know, that determine how we run our organization, th which are actually set by a multi-stakeholder community across our enti entire service region, which includes, as I said, many jurisdictions. And it's also something, you know, like from a sanction perspective, um, I think that needs to be uh, decided, imposed. I don't know if that's the correct English word or not, actually by, by public authorities. Hopefully, you know, with due process in a democratic uh, fashion, demonstrating that a certain sanction is indeed ne necessary and proportionate in, 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 in relation to the goals that are meant to be achieved, that is going to be effective. And the request from the, the Ukrainian government as such, you know, and us potentially follow up, follow, following up on that, um, which we, we, we couldn't do and we argued why not. I wouldn't consider that as such a sanction from a, a, um, an actual a public authority that this uh, uh, has, you know, the authority actually to impose a sanction. Um, but just so you know, um, there are other sanctions with, uh, which are set in the European Union. In our case, economic uh, sanctions. There are lists of entities, uh, uh, private uh, persons that are put on a sanctioned list, in this case also from, uh, from Russia. And um, potentially, and not only potentially, but actually, some of those are also uh, related to members that we provide service to. So we are affected by uh, the sanctions, and a number of uh, those members we actually have to freeze uh, the resources uh, for. So they cannot trans transfer, for instance, uh, IP resources. I cannot get additional ones. It is probably good to, to emphasize the fact, you know, while, while those resources are frozen, they can still continue to use them. So, for instance, a Russian ISP or something, you know, could still offer a service to its, uh, its, its customers, businesses, and, and, and end users. Um, but besides, you know, the, the, the fact, you know, that based on uh, the not having the mandate, I think, uh, to, to, to respond to a request like the, the one the Ukrainian government came up with, I think it's also important to mention the fact that this entire system and the services that we provide is basically based on trust. We don't have any God-given authority actually to enforce what we're doing, right? It's only because people actually believe that we are a trusted, neutral, authoritative entity in this case, you know, that we provide uh, uh, those resources and related to that, we have a public database that everyone can check, you know, like to actually see who has been provided which resources and actually is allowed uh, entitled to use those. 
uh, networks use those resources uh, then to base their routing decisions on. So this it's only based on trust. If someone says, oh, I don't trust this, I'm going to set up my own registry and I'm going to use my own resources, technically speaking, that is an option. So from that perspective, you know, it is quite a vulnerable system. And um, we al already see, um, and I, do, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to or not, but I think I noticed a, a Russian governmental uh, official on, uh, on the Zoom uh, call. Um, we already see, like, in certain areas that governments will respond to the fact, you know, if they are affected by, by sanctions, and in this case by a private entity operating uh, within the Netherlands from Amsterdam that, that is indeed offering quite a critical service in terms, in terms of running the internet, that how come uh, within that particular uh, 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 jurisdiction, when affected by certain legislation, uh, that uh, uh, body can uh, act upon that and it has an impact on another jurisdiction. That, that, that should not be the case. Uh, maybe this should be like embedded this functionality within an international multilateral organization, for instance. So we already see those types of tensions and discussions arising. And again, you know, to, just to emphasize the, the vulnerability of, uh, of, of the system and the trust, you know, that is uh, fundamental to it. Um, I, I believe it now here. I think, you know, it's important to, to, to continue the discussion. Uh, any, any other questions, you know, that might pop up, happy to follow up on those. Thank you. Thank you very much for this, Bastian. And I'm well aware that Vincent has to leave in a moment. So before opening the floor and, and going on with our discussion, uh, I wanted to give the floor to Vince just for him to comment on the various interventions that have been heard so far. Oh, thank you very much, Olivier. Um, I think, uh, first of all, I value this discussion. I want to reiterate that. Second, I want to ask you to distinguish between the um, technical operation of the internet as a communication system and the way in which it gets used in the applications especially so uh, Veronica and I are not in disagreement except that I would say that the underlying core communications functionality can be and, and should be thought of as neutral but the application space is a whole other story and we're I think she, she's nodding so I think we are in agreement about that and that is our challenge. How do we maintain this important underlying infrastructure while at the same time finding a way to discipline bad behavior? And part of this discussion uh, is to discover ways in which we might achieve that objective. So I do have to leave now, but I will uh, look forward to any summaries that you might produce from today's meeting and other summaries coming out of the IGF 2022 in general. Uh, I'll see to it that that gets to the leadership panel. So thank you all for your time. Please keep working on this. It's a very hard problem, but it's important that we find some solutions. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Vint, and um, good luck on your uh, uh, leadership panel uh, coming up. Um, Bill Woodcock, you wanted to respond to um, Iria's uh, intervention. Yeah, um, I think that there's a very useful debate to be had here um and i'd like to engage in it a little bit not uh out of any inherent uh, need for disputatiousness or any even particular disagreement with anything she said but a number of the things that that you said miss piosa um allow uh you know further exploration of, of this idea um one of the things that you pointed out scoping scoping the problem i think very correctly to targeted sanctions which are what you know actually happen now and what are actually you know at at issue um the question becomes who's to decide who is a bad actor and um i believe you posited the possibility of a multi-stakeholder organization of some sort that would ensure uh, that sanctioning decisions are made with respect to human rights um so well i agree with that in principle the role of such an organization if it were to have any effect would presumably be to decide whether or not government mandated sanctions should be implemented by private parties who are governed by those governments which puts it in the position of encouraging legal non-compliance now from a moral perspective obviously there are many cases in which one would wish to encourage 
corporations and individuals to not comply with applicable law when applicable law is not aligned with human rights. Um, however, that's a difficult position to create and maintain structurally, right? And if you're talking to a national incumbent phone company, which may be in part own, owned by a government, telling them not to comply with applicable law in the jurisdiction in which they are operating is a really tough call. Um, so that's that's one thing. The second thing I'd like to bring up is it, we kind of can't have our cake and eat it too in the sense that if we want to talk about this as multi-stakeholderism and say that, well, um, you know, multi stake because the internet is global and it is inherently multi stakeholder, uh, multi stakeholder governance processes should be used to make consequential decisions like this. Right now, who decides who's a bad actor is the internet technical community purely. There is no other input to that decision. And as I said, it's a decision that, you know, one organization alone is making 400,000 times a day taken collectively, we're looking at maybe 10 million times a day that decision is being made. Um, governments have essentially no input to that right now. Governments are a stakeholder, right? They should have some input to this. Also, they're a stakeholder with collectively 2000 years of historical experience working in this specific area. The internet technical community is under no illusions that has any expertise in the area of sanctions per se right blocking malware sure sanctions not so much so i think those those are a couple of points of uh you know potential rebuttal or something and uh, i would love to see this discussion go further because it's something that i i am fascinated with and have to deal with so i want to do it well thanks bill yeah okay. i see your hand up Yes, a very specific point. I I I agree almost in everything with you. We are we are knowing a huge disagreement in principle, uh, but it's one point I want to call attention to everyone in in, in the in the panel. Um, uh, you mentioned uh, the difficulty of uh, uh, in don't comply with the uh, in, uh, legislation in in the matter. So. Uh, we, you're talking specifically about national legislation because there's no international law on the matter. Uh, we are going to get into the problem of having uh, very different di legislation in national level treating these problems in, in kind of opposite contradictory way. So all the countries who are working on their model of sovereignty and uh, in, internet are taking an approach is completely different than that uh, model we are used to the open free uh, internet. So when what, what that is going to eventually clash and what, 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 what how we are going to decide whether it's applicable the law from those uh, countries who decide well we are going to have our own internet and when it's applied the law from those countries who see no, this is the only one global internet, and they, you ca you can splinter it. So that is going to be an issue with coin next. So it's if we don't don't if we are not prepared for that issue, uh, it's going to explode. This is going to be, be it's, it's exploding in our hands. So uh, I I I I want to I I don't have the solution. I, I, I but I think it's something we need we need to start a conversation on that and trying to anticipate whether we move to toward having a more uh, active role in making these kind of decisions. We are going to face that problem sooner than later. Thank you for this uh, area. And I'm now going to open the, the queue to the wider uh, all participants in, in here. I'm going to ask also, since I only have a very small window into the room, that if any of my colleagues are in the room and notice some hands up, they notify me uh, uh, via the Zoom so I can also slot them in the queue. At the moment, I've got Sheva Sobramanian Motosami, 
Hadia Aminiawi, and then Alejandro Pesanti uh, in the uh, online queue. Let's go over to Shiva. Um, uh, it is uh, well understood that there is uh, there are some geopolitical uh, interferences uh, in internet governance, and uh, politics uh, is uh, seeping in in matters related to internet governance. There are two ways we could respond to that. One, politics can be countered by politics. It could uh, there could be reactions and uh, responses uh, from one side to another, which is, I think, not the way to go for the internet uh, to protect the internet. The way to uh, protect the internet is to isolate the internet from politics completely. To emphasize to the parties uh, who are uh, geopolitical that this is a uh, geopolitical this is a uh, this is not a geopolitical space and uh, politics has to be out of uh, uh, internet governance in order to protect uh, the internet and what we need is uh, a shield against politics around the core of the internet that is how that uh, that is an ap approach that we have to cultivate and that is something that every organization has to do emphasize that it's a non-political space rather than respond to politics. Thank you. Thanks very much for your intervention, Shiva. Next is Hadia Alminyawi. Um, hello. Hi, um, this is Hadia Alminyawi. I uh, work for the uh, Egyptian regulator, uh, but I attend uh, the IGF and I speak in my uh, personal capacity. Um, so uh, when it comes to technical um, issues or technical harm, uh, I guess from a technical point of view, it, it is easy to spot uh, uh, something going wrong or uh, to spot, uh, spot harm and uh, stop it uh, in a way or another. And then the issue ca becomes, you know, uh, how do you punish those who um, initiated this harm? Um, but. But the other, um, but if we're talking now about internet fragmentation, um, I, I think Veronica uh, raised a very good point, uh, where she um, spoke about uh, nationalization uh, um, as being a true um, uh, threat to the uh, one uh, global internet, um, and as a recipe for uh, fragmentation. Um, and my question here. How do we, um, and, and Ver Veronica also mentions, you know, we need to fight this, we need to uh, stop it from happening, uh, but how? H how can we do that? And um, and I, I, I will just c have a quick comment on what Shiva just said, uh, where um, uh, the internet uh, should not be a, a political um, uh, space well well that that's not possible anymore um, uh, the internet now is a tool uh, used by uh, politicians and 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 to think that uh, we can uh, say you know we are not going to uh, make the internet a political uh, uh, space that, that that that's not realistic uh, um, I go back to uh, Veronica and uh, and ask uh, how do you how do you think we could do that Thank you. Thank you, Hadia. Veronica, that's it. I can quickly go. Uh, thank you so much for that comment. Um, uh, I would fully agree with you and your point that we need political solutions because we are in a political situation here. Um, one thing that governments at some point have agreed on is the United Nations. Um, and we see, for example, with the cyber diplomacy negotiations, that there is possibilities to find solutions on the internet, on 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 on, on making it more peaceful. Um, and this shouldn't be a process where, and, and and I fully agree with points that have been raised with regards to who decides how the internet should be regulated. And I think that is a really, really, really big part of the problem we have right now because it can't be. Germany and it can't be the European Union and it also can't be Google. We all have to be included in it and I think that's why the IGF is so important. But to come back to my point, I think the UN could be a first forum to try to find solutions with inclusion of um, multi-stakeholders, of course, because we are no longer in a situation that we can't exclude them. Um, 
and that should have that has to go through a process that is completely inclusive through all to all states and uh, big companies at least I would say um, because otherwise we find with regards for example to the um, declaration on the future of the democratic in uh, democratic internet um, states that haven't been included in the process and therefore reject the process so we need to find an inclusive process and I think the UN could be a first solution in, um, in achieving that. Thank you, uh, Veronica. If I could just take, take you uh, up on this, because you, uh, you mentioned here the, the UN framework, um, and yet when uh, one looks at the IGF, that really is purely advisory and, and purely a, a discussion forum. The UN General Assembly is usually the assembly that takes positions and that uh, actions things. Uh, Olivier, can you hear me? Is Bastian speaking? Yes, Bastian, go ahead. Now, I, I can imagine that you don't have like a, a clear picture of who is in the room here and people that are not in Zoom and that would like to contribute to this discussion. So is, do we have room for people here to ask questions? Uh, definitely, definitely. I was going to, to give the floor to Alejandro first and then um, and pass the, the floor to, to um, someone in the room who will be able to, to point out who wishes to contribute. I can assist there. So, okay, sure. Thank you. Thanks for this. So, Alejandro. Uh, thank you, Olivia. And yes, uh, thank you, Bastian and uh, Veronica uh, for for taking up this uh, on-site on coordination part. Um, as Bill says in the chat, the internet is not a monolith. It exists within every country, every independent network. It's a, it's a, a conjunction of, uh, of networks globally. Uh, the uh, as as uh, Haja has said, uh, it is not possible to conceive of the internet as exempt or uh, purified from political intervention. It's uh, one more part of humanity, humankind's shared space. But we have to think and think hard: is what this internet is going to be now that we can have uh, events like uh, war or warlike events in the core of the internet that can affect. Uh, the, the more centrally and more uh, densely connected parts, we will still be able to route around any damage or any congestion or any censorship. But uh, there was a very interesting discussion uh, about a week ago, fragmentation held by Bill Drake and where Vince Cerf and Andrew Sullivan from ISOC made it very clear there is no such thing as a splintered internet. Once it splinters, it's not the internet. And we have to deliver to the governments and the leaderships uh, uh, that uh, you can't splinter the internet. If you start imposing a sovereign law, uh, you will start actually removing your country from the internet totally, or at least to a significant uh, The Internet Society, myself and others have delivered, have created uh, frameworks, which you can use as a seed where you can see how different policy proposals, how different treaties, the work of the open-ended working group or the group of governmental experts of the General Assembly of the UN, etc., uh, how these proposals can actually be commensurate with the internet or not. And uh, with that knowledge, we have to work uh, on a multi-stakeholder basis first. Uh, here, uh, Veronica, who I'm very glad to see joining as, I, as, as well as uh, Haja, because we see this new generation of scholars and doers, people who are simultaneously scholars, uh, policy makers, and operators. Uh, but just uh, it's, it's remarkable that uh, actually the, the multilateral framework has been very, very slow coming behind a multi stakeholder. So it's more like let's bring in the multilateral into the multi stakeholder than the other way around. Thanks. Thanks for your intervention, Alejandro. And I'll turn to Bastian then to uh, give the floor to people in the room, to our participants in Addis Abeba. Thank you very much, Olivier. Um, I see two, three hands. Yeah. Shall I start off with the gentleman over here? Thank you very much. Uh, uh, and if you could pl please introduce yourself and uh, any organization that you represent, if any, or if you represent yourself. Thank you. Wonderful. Unless there is a reason to keep anonymous. 
wonderful. Thank uh, unless you. there is such a reason, Alejandro. Yeah, but I, I would hope people introduce themselves. I, we certainly have so far. <laughs> uh, my name is Tulio Andrade. I um, represent the Brazilian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and uh, I would like to bring uh, the perspective of the Global South. Uh, first of all, from the scientific uh, point of view, uh, we consider the Internet and obviously uh, a complex system. Uh, so, from a system dynamics perspective, um, the Internet uh, does follow a stochastic behavior in which uh, any dramatic intervention in the Internet may uh, obviously lead to unintended consequences, uh, including in terms of food and energy supply chain. So, from the Global South perspective, uh, what we need the international community to do is actually to uh, work on the basis of humility, empathy, solidarity, uh, rather than a punitive um, approach, um, which could actually be uh, prone to bias or to political and economic agendas, because um, always when we have uh, political and economic agendas uh, 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 rolling the dice, what the reality that we have on the ground is that those that are the most vulnerable and they are least responsible and least involved in great power competitions, they are the ones who suffer. So um, we do understand that um, uh, there is now a dynamic in which the internet uh, is being used for politics, but this is highly concerning. What we need to do is actually to prevent the internet from being weaponized uh, for the uh, uh, for goals related to international security and to recover the vocation of the internet society and the information society um, enshrined in the UWIS uh, uh, framework. Therefore, we, we, we have now uh, the sustainable development goals. They need to be the ultimate priority of the international community. And we have le very little time to uh, achieve and to leverage the internet for those goals. And if we fail to achieve the sustainable development goals, then again, from a system dynamics perspective, we are going to have a lot of instability and a political situation in which um, uh, social and economic uh, instability drivers may lead us to um, uh, a prohibitive and a fragmented co cooperation uh, environment that may impair uh, our priority of leaving our one behind. So we very much understand uh, that there are some trends related to uh, the use of internet for political and international security and geopolitics, but this trend must stop and we must use the internet to achieve the sustainable development goals. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tulio. The gentleman over there, please, introduce yourself. Okay. My name is Minilik from... Okay. Can I proceed? Okay. My name is Minilik from uh, Information Network Society. Can you Network speak closer to the mic, please? Closer. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, it is a wonderful presentation about the geopolitical neutrality of the global internet. But I have a couple of questions. The first one is, as you know, the global internet user is 4.95 billion, and what is the current status of the domain name conflict? Uh, uh, ICA and multi-stakeholders are, what are the working towards this uh, IP address designation? As you can, as the can, as you can say, it is in the space is not a political space. The internet is a global international space. Yeah. The second question is, uh, 
uh, ICA and the multi stakeholders towards the policy uh, to designate the unique identifier. What are the progress? What are the progress of the policy regarding to the designation of the unique identifier? Thank you. Thank you. I saw some more hands. I, I suggest you take all of the questions and then give people the opportunity to respond. Please go. Thank you very much. <coughs> uh, I'm Wanda Ling uh, from Minister of Innovation and Technology, Ethiopia, and um, I'm a uh, policy making uh, analyst. Uh, I have a few questions about uh, this uh, uh, sanctions of the internet, especially when the making uh, a sanction to the uh, some geopolitics uh, country uh, it's a very dangerous to making usual a uh, business uh, it's doing it uh, in a good way uh, especially in uh, small business and the startups will be uh, very hard to uh, these sanctions and it is linked to uh, in another way in uh, uh, innovation and the technology uh, developments. So what will make uh, this possible to the best policy making or the uh, policy uh, solutions to this uh, sanctions? Thank you very much. Thank you. And I see a hand. Is it a lady next to you? <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. This is Nazmo Salihin from Bangladesh. I'm uh, speaking on behalf of myself. Um, if we uh, if we think uh, to make the internet uh, 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 avoid to politics from the internet, then uh, my um, my understanding is we can enhance the ethical standard, moral standard of the user, and uh, the understanding uh, the the. the mental state of the user of the internet and I think the only way to make the internet free of politics is to make the, the, the user mind uh, free of politics and make the minds of the users more global and more uh, acceptable for each other. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Olivier, if, if it's okay, I propose to, I don't see any hands here, but to close the queue here. Uh, we have, I think, seven minutes left, so I will leave it we up have to a, you. Too. Yeah, we have seven. Thank you uh, very much for this, and thank you for all the interventions. I'd like to see if uh, there's any reaction from our panelists on, on what they've heard. I also note that there's been a discussion going on in the uh, in the chat, <laughs> which which often happens. There's a, a life on the chat and a life in the room and, and, and online. So I'm, I'd like to um, hear from our, our, uh, our participants. I see Shiva has put his hand up. Uh, I noticed something very interesting in one of the panelists' questions uh, that uh, he said uh, this trend must stop. The, I mean, if we respond to two countries playing politics and more countries respond by playing politics, then it becomes uh, more and more uh, splintered and uh, that must stop and uh, i don't know there is there is there is not there has not been a precedent but the we have to make a precedent by declaring this as a space completely free of politics that is when uh, the geopolitical harm that is happening to the internet will stop that is the only way to preserve the internet thank you Thank you for your contribution, uh, Shiva. And as noted, we, we do have very little time until the end of this session. So let's turn to each one of our panelists on their uh, on their points. I, OK, we'll have one more person um, because I they haven't spoken yet. Mokaberi, uh, Samir Hussain. And then each one of our panelists will be able to uh, give their final comments. Hello, may I ask my question? Yes, please go ahead. You have the floor. Mokaberi, Samir Hussain. Hello, uh, I'm Amir from uh, Iranian Academic Community. Uh, hello, everyone and uh, distinguished panelists. Uh, it was a very interesting session. And uh, first of all, I should thank you for organizing <clears throat> this timely session. Uh, 
I, I would like to say that the issue, the important issue of geopolitical neutrality of uh, global internet should be reflected in global digital compact. And uh, this approach is very useful for global community. My suggestion regarding uh, this issue that uh, could help uh, uh, global community is, the first one is development of internationally legally binding agreements on cybersecurity based on principles of international law. The second suggestion is establishment of global framework rules and norms on accountable behavior of global digital platforms and service provider in data security, illegal content, and competition law. And uh, defining uh, the, the, the third ish suggestion is defining a common vision for internet as a peaceful and development oriented environment for public good, not as a new battlefield and militarized environment. Uh, through signing a global declaration by all member states. And the last one, internationalization of internet and internet public core uh, as a trust building measure uh, could help uh, internet, uh, global internet to be geopolitically neutral. Thank you very much indeed for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. That's uh, taken to the record. And let's then uh, go through each one of our panelists and uh, we'll start again in alphabetical order then. Let's start with Bastian, please. Bastian Goslings. Yeah, thank you very much. And everyone, you know, thank you very much for participating and making very relevant and interesting uh, comments. Um, especially want to comment the, 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 um, the input from the Brazilian uh, delegate. Uh, very useful, you know, and um, I find I, did, I definitely think you find an ally in us, you know, if, if you can make this uh, this discussion, you know, uh, work at the UN level, which is a bit harder for us as a, a representative from the technical community. We don't have direct access to the UN. But in terms of, of, of solutions, longer term solutions, maybe related to that, I, I do think it, it is very important and it's not new as such, but that for us as technical community, it's, it's very important to uh, continuously uh, engage with the public officials and public authorities. They are the ones, uh, we refer to the fact that is the internet uh, uh, neutral or not. I definitely do not think it is. And, and governments are going to do whatever they want to do or feel the need to do within their own jurisdictions. But what we can do is contribute, you know, with regard to knowledge to exactly, you know, convey the message. How does the internet work? What are the underlying technical functionalities, right, in order to create this global, uh, unique, interconnected uh, network of networks? And um, I definitely see that, you know, I, I'm Dutch. I definitely see that from uh, the Dutch policymakers, that, like this demand, you know, please help us in order to determine uh, uh, legislation and, and what also, like, especially when it comes to unintended consequences, right? What is the impact? Is it going to be effective what you're doing? Um, and I see the same on the European Union level. So I, I do consider that as, as positive, but it, it remains, a con we need to do that. You know, it has to be on our agenda to continuously help these uh, public officials, right? To give them the knowledge and also like help them uh, uh, determine, you know, what they think from a public interest perspective they, they have to do. And from that perspective, I also think, and it's been mentioned a couple of times that it's useful to distinguish, you know, the core of the internet, the functionalities, uh, the, the numbering, uh, the naming, the, the routing systems, as opposed to everything that happens on top of the internet. Um, close to 5 billion people are on the internet and what happens offline more and more happens uh, online. Sometimes even more, you know, um, uh, the effects become stronger because of the network effects and the specificities of, of the internet. Um, so I think this dialogue has to continue uh, uh, all the time and it will not, not stop. And, uh, you know, whether it's, it's appropriate to, to actually determine exemptions for core of the internet functionalities, either within the European Union or maybe, maybe confidence building measures on a UN level. I think those are ideas, you know, that are, could definitely be uh, worthwhile considering and, and talking and further discussing about, maybe also within the IG, IGF. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Bastian. I'm a, I'm a bit concerned about time. Uh, let's go to Bill Woodcock. I think this is, at some levels, a very practical matter. There are two sides to this. There's the intergovernmental harmonization side, getting governments to agree on what sanctions are. Uh, and that work is being coordinated inside the OECD. Uh, and on the other side, there are the, some 20,000 uh, internet networks that have to decide what it is that they are going to 
uh, block and what laws they're going to comply with and so forth. And that work is being coordinated at sanctions.net. Um, so I would encourage everyone who wants to participate in this conversation ongoing to either work within the OECD framework. Uh, there is, for instance, the, um, biz the business constituency, um, if you want to work from the private sector there rather than through government, uh, or uh, you know, participate in the sanctions.net coordination process. Thanks for this, Bill. Clearly, uh, the beginning of a, of a discussion and, and a dialogue rather than uh, reaching the end. <laughs> we still have a lot to cover. It Next, we have Elia Piosa. Following uh, what Bill say, uh, is an, another matter of concern is, is sanctions being discussed by the OECD and the rest of the world is in what part of the table uh, that that would be an, another issue so the, the for for a, for this to work had to be a little bit more discussion and it's not going to be easy it's not going to be fast but it's important and so i think it ha had to be some mechanisms for including different governments for different part of the world and having a, a system with more robust and uh, more stable on political change uh, internal to the country. So otherwise this is going to be, well, we had this rule when this, this kind of uh, uh, political parties are ruling. Uh, we had this other rule when other political parties are ruling and that is not something I, I think we should expose the internet to that. So we, we need to something more stable. I completely agree the, the internet is political because we, the users, are political things, but we need to have some 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 criteria for making this a little bit more stable. So the regime will go to be used to make decisions have to be more stable than our uh, varying political views in different events. Thank you, Area. Next is Veronica Datsun. Thank you so much, and thank you for everyone that contributed. It was uh, incredibly insightful. Um, I want to uh, just re-emphasize what Bastian said. Um, I think policymakers need the technical community to understand what is going on. And that's, that is why these discussions are so important for both perspectives, because frankly speaking, um, we, we need the technical expertise to understand what is doable, what is achievable, and what is sensible. Um, I also want to emphasize what was just said. I think the conversation is just starting, and that's why I'm really grateful for the IGF and these institutions or, or forums to, to, to bring people like us together. Um, to prevent the internet from being weaponized, I still think we need regulation, um, and that's what we will try to achieve best. I believe in a multi-stakeholder approach in this regard. I also do believe we need to find a decolonial uh, south to north perspective. We need to include everyone at the table. We need to include companies as well as policymakers. Um, and if there are any suggestions, please reach out. I'm always open for um, comments and feedback and um, insights from all perspectives. Thank you so much. Thank you, Veronica. And closing words from Alejandro Pizanti. Thank you, Olivier. Thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks, Olivier, for, because you took a lot of the load of uh, making this uh, panel possible and to every participant. Uh, we're not going to do away with politics of the internet. That cat, that, that cat is out of the bag. has been out there since before the internet was built. The choice of the policy preferences for an open internet was already a political choice. So let's, you know, uh, start uh, start again. Uh, this, uh, what we need is a space where politics can take place forever without destroying the software, the internet itself. The internet is not one monolith, as Bill has emphasized. It's lots of networks. There's a great incentive we have to recover for the governments now, mantras which we had forever on the internet side, like connectivity it's, is its own price. You lose more than you gain whenever you lose connectivity, despite the gains that you may want to, to achieve. So let's uh, start uh, pushing more 
for outcomes at the multilateral level that are compatible with, with what has been happening on the technical and multi-stakeholder side for so many years. Uh, it's not doing away with geopolitics, it's having the geopolitics that preserves the internet as much as we have cared to preserve Antarctica, the oceans, or space. Thank you. Thank you, Alejandro. And uh, just to remind, uh, uh, well, first, thank all of our panelists for their really, really insightful uh, points. And of course, the, the people that have intervened in, and that are participating in this uh, discussion, clearly the beginning of further discussions. Uh, and um, I think the only thing I can add is that this was a session of the Dynamic Coalition on Core Internet Values. And uh, I think that we definitely have uh, some more events going on in this uh, regarding this topic. Um, it, it really is something that uh, we need to do. Um, so thanks to everybody for having participated in, uh, in this session. I realize we're a bit late, but um, uh, we will be uh, publishing some takeaways from this. And if you are interested in the work of the Dynamic Coalition and just to take part uh, in, in our work and continue the discussion, with our community, uh, then the details are on the IGF website on, on how, to, uh, how to get in touch. Uh, we uh, are not elitist at all, we accept everyone, and um, uh, we're very varied people as well, so sometimes we disagree on things. In fact, often we disagree on things, but uh, sometimes we also find consensus, and this is really what this dialogue uh, helps us uh, achieve eventually. Uh, at some point. So thanks everybody and um, have a very good rest of the day and uh, safe travels since this is the, the last day uh, for those people that are in Addis Ababa. So uh, have, uh, have uh, safe travels back home uh, to wherever you are. Thank you. Thank and you so much. Is now over. Thank you.